So the final question on the 2018 AP Calc BC exam was a non-calculator question that involved a series, and that's typically what's been showing up there for quite some time. Uh, in this particular problem, they give us the Maclaurin series representation for natural log of 1 plus x. They tell us that that series converges to that function, uh, and then they say f of x is the function defined right here. So x natural log of 1 plus x over 3. What part A asks us to do is it asks us for the first four non-zero terms as well as the general term for the Maclaurin series for f. So if we have this series representation for g, uh, so I define g of x to be natural log of 1 plus x just so I could use some, some nice simple notation to understand. The difference between f of x, which is specified right here, and g of x is that we're putting x over 3 in place of this x and then we're also multiplying by this additional x that's out in front of the logarithm so f of x is equal to x times g of x over 3 so what I did is I took the series that converges to g of x and I replaced all of the x's with x over 3 and then I also multiplied that series by x so as I simplified this a little bit, because I, I did want to find a way to write the general term, uh, so I went ahead and I distributed this x into all of those terms. That gave me this for the first term. I, I kind of cleaned up these, the rest of these terms a little bit, and, and we're going to benefit by having done this in some of the later parts of the problem. Um, so I noticed there was a 3 squared within this denominator, and I just kind of had that join the 2 that was already in the denominator of the main fraction. Similarly, we're going to have a 3 to the third power uh, in the denominator of that numerator. I just had that join the denominator uh, of 3 that was already there, and the 3 to the fourth joined the 4 that was already the denominator of this final term. Uh, you do see the power of x's upticked by one on each and every term and that was because we were distributing this x in as we went from this line that we initially wrote out to this new line so then I looked at this line and, and I said I'm gonna re-index this uh, I, I'm gonna have my index begin at one I could have very well begin my index at two uh, or at zero you just have to kind of denote where you're starting your index if you're choosing to start it somewhere different. I didn't necessarily start it anywhere different, but I still kind of, by habit, showed what my uh, terms were indexed with. And so I'm going to try to write a rule to produce this term, then to produce this term, then to produce this term. So what I notice is I notice that my series is obviously alternating. And so I, I want, when my k value is 1, I want to have a positive coefficient and when my index value is two or even I want a negative coefficient so negative one to the k plus one still makes that happen um, I see that the power on each of these x's in the numerator is one above where I have my index sitting and so I'm gonna have a k plus one as the power of x in that numerator uh, the, there's a coefficient of one here technically right one times three it's a little more obvious when you look at the rest of these terms two times three squared three times three to the third and so on so I've got a coefficient of K in the denominator and then I have three raised to the first power on K equals one term second power on the index two on the term that's indexed with two uh, so the power on three within the denominator is going to correspond to directly what the index is and you see that across all of the terms so here are your first four non-zero terms and there is your general term part B asks us to determine the interval of convergence of the Maclaurin series that we just came up with in part A show the work that leads to your answer so if you're looking for the interval of convergence of a series you're going to go with the ratio test to determine that in almost every single circumstance. And so the ratio test requires for us to check the limit that I've listed right here. And I wrote the series that we represented at the end of part A in, in sigma notation here. And I had to produce the A sub K plus one term. And then I had to divide by the A sub K term. And so you notice I didn't include any of the negative one to whatever power ends up here in either of these fractions, and that's because of the absolute values, right? I know this is going to be the, either a negative one or a positive one. If I'm in absolute values, they both become positive ones, and I can just totally omit the alternating terms. That's why you don't see it being included. So when I'm computing the k plus first term, I put k plus one in place of this k, and then I add one, and I get k plus two. 
I put a k plus 1 here, and I have k plus 1. I put a k plus 1 here, and I have 3 to the k plus 1. Rather than dividing by a sub k, I right away multiplied by the reciprocal of a sub k. Right, so you see that these appeared in the numerator of the second fraction. And then what I have in the numerator appeared in the denominator. Right, Multiplied by the reciprocal cuts out a step, uh, allows you to be a little bit more quick and efficient with this. Uh, then when you use the ratio test, you will get some cancellation to happen. I have k plus 2 factors of x within this numerator. I have k plus 1 factors of x down here. So every single factor of x that's in this denominator is going to cancel with most of the factors of x in the numerator, but I do have this one extra factor of x that sits there. Similarly, I have k plus 1 factors of 3 within this denominator, and I have k factors of 3 within this numerator. So all k of the 3s are going to cancel with k of the 3s down here, which is going to leave me with a single 3 in the denominator. So I have a single x in the numerator, a single 3 in the denominator. What I see students do from time to time, and it's tempting to do, you, you get a lot of cancellation happen typically when you're using the ratio test. I can't cancel this K with this K, right? That'll, that's a direct violation of the order of operations. I'm dipping into this set of grouping symbols to do that division if I, if I try to do that. So I still have a K in the numerator and a K plus 1 in the denominator. I next factored out anything that didn't have a K attached to it anymore, X is unaffected by k, so I factored out x, but I did have to keep the absolute values around the x, right? x might be positive, x might be negative, so I kept it inside the absolute values. The 3 is unaffected by k, so I also factored out the 3. I don't need the absolute values around it. It's, it's already a positive 3, so that'd be kind of redundant to include the absolute values around it. Um, inside the limit, I have a k and a k plus 1. You will notice I dropped the absolute values there because I'm thinking about where k is going. k is going to positive infinity, so this is going to be a really big positive value, and this is going to be a really big positive value. So I dropped the absolute values inside the limit too. Um, using L'Hopital's rule, or just kind of thinking about this limit, you're going to realize that this limit right here has a value of 1 as k tends to infinity. So 1 times absolute value of x over 3 is just absolute value of x over 3. Now what the ratio test says is the ratio test says that you converge when this limit is less than 1, you diverge if it's greater than 1, but you are inconclusive if the limit equals 1. So I needed to set this to be less than 1 in order to find my interval of convergence, and if I multiply by 3 on the right-hand side of the inequality, I get the absolute value of x is less than 3, that's going to be true as long as x is between negative 3 and 3. Now you notice I did include positive 3, and, and I didn't do that by just guessing. I had to do some further analysis. What I just said 30 seconds ago is that the ratio test is inconclusive when the limit equals 1. If I put a 3 in place of x, this limit is equal to 1. If I put a negative 3 in place of x, the result to this limit is equal to 1. So I have to manually try to think about what's going on with this series at those endpoints. So when I put 3 in place of the x in the series, right? so I'm going back up to the series representation here. Uh, when I put 3 in place of this x, I have 3 to the k plus 1 in the numerator. We have some similar cancellation happen here that happened within our ratio test a few minutes ago. I have k plus 1 factors of 3 in the numerator. I have k factors of 3 in the denominator. Almost all of the 3s in the top are going to cancel with all of the 3s in the bottom. This is what I'm left with. If I didn't have this 3 here, I recognize this as the alternating harmonic series. The alternating harmonic series converges. Well, when I multiply a series that converges by 3, I'm still going to have a finite value. I'm still going to have a series that converges. So that's why I included the upper endpoint of 3 within my interval of convergence, but then when you consider x equals negative 3, you're actually not going to be able to include that. The, the algebra here is a little sneakier, because when you put negative 3 in place of this x, you have negative 3 to the k plus 1, and I can't cancel that with the 3 to the k that's down here, but I want to do some cancellation here. So what I did right away is I broke that negative 3 to the k plus 1 up into negative 1 to the k plus 1, times 3 to the k plus 1, exact same cancellation we had on the prior line back here happens between these components of the numerator and denominator. Uh, so I had a factor of 3 left in the numerator, just like we did in the prior analysis. If I multiply these 
like bases together and add the exponents. k plus 1 plus k plus 1 gives me 2k plus 2. Think about this exponent right here. If I take a value of k and I multiply it by 2, I get an even value. If I add 2 to an even value, I stay at an even value. So this term right here is always positive 1. So if I have 1 over k, that's the harmonic series. The harmonic series diverges. If I have something that diverges being multiplied by 3, I'm still going to diverge, which is why I didn't include that lower endpoint of negative 3. Last part of this talked about the fourth degree Taylor polynomial for f based at 0. It says to use the alternating series air bound to find an upper bound for this error. So what's the maximum possible error you're going to incur by estimating f of 2 by evaluating the fourth degree Taylor polynomial for this function at 2? So what I did is I kind of copy and pasted this in from part A. Right here are the first five terms of the series. The maximum possible error that I can have here is going to be generated by the first omitted term evaluated at where I'm evaluating the fourth degree polynomial. The first omitted term would be this term right here. And when I evaluate that term at 2, I end up with this. And if you simplify that, you get 8 over 81. This right here would be enough to get you credit for part C. So just pay attention to how you, your teacher wants you to specify your answers. If you're on the AP exam, you can definitely leave it unsimplified. I should have another symbol here. Let's see. The first omitted term, the absolute value of that is equal to this fraction right here. 